this young lady speak uh, from the perspective of being a family person, a family member, uh, that is someone who has actually lived experience with the child and family serving system as it relates to mental health, behavioral health, trauma, uh, informed services. But you've also heard her talk quite candidly about cultural issues in delivering services, about how to acknowledge the importance and role of a family member as you are providing services. And she's even consulted with us through the PCAT grant around helping the into the development of family members with that lived experience to becoming uh, subject matter experts on treatment teams uh, on behalf of understanding better how to engage families, how to support families, how to address a family's needs, and how to hear the family's need. Uh, many times we as professionals assume that we know what families need, uh, and we've got a prescription for that, and we deliver it, and when they don't follow it, they're non-compliant, and if they would just do what we'd say, then everything would be fine. Well, Ms. Melanie Funches, who is a colleague, a dear friend, and a real subject matter expert in this area, who is nationally certified as a family support specialist, who brings this technical assistance to programs and jurisdictions all around the country, has accepted the invitation to come back one more time to Memphis to talk to us about, hey, I'm sorry, I just looked over and saw my niece walk in. <laughs> and nobody told me she was coming. Hi, sweetie. Uh, but Melanie has come to talk to us today about the village and the role of the village in mitigating ACEs where risk factors are not predictive factors due to protective factors. So Melanie, please come up and share your wisdom. Something else to understand about the village. The village transcends program. 
When a child, a child before a child enters kindergarten or after a child graduates high school, in that hour after, before 7.30, 8 o'clock when they go to school, after 3, 4, 5 o'clock when they come home from school, the village is there. Understand also that the village can be a source of learning, strength, support, and healing. But also that the village has been neglected and that the village is like a garden. Does anybody here garden? Flowers, vegetables? When you garden, you have to break up the ground, right? And after you break up the ground, you plant the seeds. You don't, you don't plant your seeds and then go away for three months and come back and expect to have fruit. You have to tend it, you have to weed it, you have to water it. When the plants start to grow, you may, if you're growing tomatoes, you may have to put a, a stick in the ground and tie it up so it grows properly. You may have to prune the leaves so that it'll grow out, start growing up. Am I right? Yes. The same is with our village. We, we want a thing, we have to sow into a thing. And we have to really understand that the, if we want, our, we want our villages to be this, to be this, what we're saying it is, we have to sow into it. We have to understand also that many of our villages have been neglected, like a garden that doesn't get tended to, and weeds grow up. In our village, the weeds that grow up look like drugs infiltrating our community. The weeds that grow up look like gang violence. The weeds that grow up look like truancy and our children not feeling unloved. The, the weeds are aces. But, like the, but we as the village can mitigate those aces just like the gardener can pull the weeds out of the garden. Are you with me? Okay, so that being said, understanding these things about the village, we have to really understand that, now how many people say, now how many of you have ever heard, and I'm going to address this up front, we used to have a village, we don't have the village anymore. Anybody heard this? Yes. How many of you believe it? Let's tell the truth. Do we believe it? And it's okay if you do, because what happens is, we believe because we don't see it the way we used to see it. I presented at NIH a few years ago about, the, uh, about natural health, and basically the village and how it exists in a social media space. And how it exists on Twitter and Facebook. And in my studies, what I found out, what I knew, I knew and I confirmed, was that we have village. It may not look like what it looked like when my grandma was in there. It may not look like what it looked like when my mom came up. It may not look like what it looked like when I was coming up. But it exists. And it exists in different ways. And that we, what we learn is that we don't see it. So when I go back talking about my children, when my oldest son graduated from high school, he came home after graduation and he began to knock on each of my neighbor's doors to get the, get the people out because it, across from me is Mr. McKnight. Mr. Mc, when we moved in the neighborhood, Mr. McKnight had been there 35 years. He came and took a picture with Mr. McKnight and thanked Mr. McKnight for getting him off the bus. When, I, when my husband was in the hospital and I would miss the bus when he was in kindergarten, first and second grade. He went next door to Mr. Kelly for being the OG in his life. Mr. Kelly had been one of these people who had been in his younger life, would take state-sponsored vacations. Do y'all know what I mean? Okay. You know, he was an independent pharmaceutical salesman and would take state-sponsored vacations. But then he turned his life around and dedicated his life to telling young kids how not to go down the road that he went. So each child in our neighborhood where I live in Rochester, New York, when they came about 11, Mr. Kelly would bring you on his porch and start to talk to you. Now we as the moms and dads, we distrusted Mr. Kelly. We didn't ask him what it was he saying, but we know that the kids who sat on the porch with Mr. Kelly and the people who listened to Ms. Kelly and repeatedly went to the porch, they didn't go to the cemetery. They didn't go to juvenile detention. And they went to school. Mr. McKnight was a kid person when they were little to make sure that everybody in the neighborhood, because he's the old, he was, when I moved into the neighborhood, I've been in my neighborhood 20 years now, he was the person who made sure everybody knew who, whose kids were who. One day, my, um, my husband had stage four cancer and was given two weeks to live 19 years ago. 
and he's still alive. Okay. I would miss the school bus because I'd have to go up to the hospital to tend to my husband, and I would sometimes get getting caught in traffic. Have anybody got caught in traffic and trying to make the school bus to get your kid off the bus? Anybody else? Am I the only person who's been through this? So I would miss the bus. Mr. McKnight, to this day, 20 years later, he still cannot say my name. I am baby girl, little girl, Marilyn. You know, I and I don't mind. I just answer to whatever it is. And, or neighbor gal. I used to be neighbor gal for about seven years. So this day, Mr. Mr. McKnight got my son off the bus. And he wrote me a note, neighbor gal. I got the boys off the bus. I can't stay home, so I'm taking him down to my ex-wife's house at 401 Melbourne Street which is about three blocks down from me. They said, they'll be fine, she cooks good. <laughs> I, well, I mean, you're asking me, why, what does this have to do with mitigating anxiety? What does this have to do? What I'm telling you is through these things is that that is how the risk factors of potential neglect, the risk factors of being exposed to violence got mitigated for my children. And I've seen this, and this, and this is not unique. And this is not unique to Rochester, New York. How many of you know people like Mr. McKnight? How many of you know people like Mr. Kelly? But the fact of the matter is we don't see them as community champions. We have to, as providers, as, as medical professionals, whatever our roles, we have got to expand our mind and to see who has value and what is considered knowledge. You know, for years, I mean, Dr. Stewart and I have known each other for many years. And I used to have, and I used to have a complex. And I'll own it. And Mr. And Dr. Stewart, I thank Dr. Stewart because she gave me the shake and said, girl, get it together. Like in that, in Moonstruck, snap out of it. Because what I used to say is, I'm just a parent. Right? I'm just a parent. I don't have my PhD. I'm not an MD. But I understand that I have a PhD in parenting. Because I'm full for full. Okay? I understand that I have a PhD in community. Because I understand village and I help people recognize their village. People say, Melanie goes around the country and she builds community. No, I don't. I go around the country and I get communities to recognize themselves to remember, reflect, and return. Remember a time when it wasn't like this. People say it was always like this. No, it wasn't. How many of y'all remember a time when it wasn't like, it, like this in the streets like it is now? Anybody? Yeah. Reflect on what were the things that, I mean, concretely, not just Pollyanna, but concretely, let's look at the things that existed in our community to keep it like it, keep it the way it was. When I reflect back, and I grew up in the Bronx, when I reflect, I remember Miss Connie, Miss Starr, and Miss Brenda, and Miss Roberta. They were the village folks. Miss Roberta, in, in New York City, we have these, um, what they call the tenement buildings, and they're five, six, four, five, six stories. And some people have windows on the front of the building, some people have windows on the back. So when kids would go outside to play, if you had a window on the back, you couldn't, on the back, you couldn't see your child. Miss Roberta, we swore. Miss Roberta had every parent's phone number on a piece of paper. Because she would go early in the morning, she'd go and she'd sit in the window like this with her avocado phone. <laughs> and if you, like, before you were able to cut across the big street, if your foot, before your foot could hit the gutter, she's like, I see you. And your, and your mother would come outside because she's already called her. <laughs> You're standing there, before you can finish contemplating the thought, and you were like, okay, I wasn't crossing the bed. I, was, I wanted to see what the gutter was like. You know, but the thing is, we had this, that was Miss Roberta. We had Miss Starr. Miss Starr was the quarter lady. In New York, when we lived in these buildings, when, you, when the ice cream truck would come and we want to get stuff, they would put this change into a napkin and tie it up and, and put it out the window, right? And so Miss Starr was like the quarter lady because she would give you a quarter to go. She gave all the kids quarters except to go and get ice cream and go. And she knew which kids may not have, 
from their parents. And she made sure that every kid had. And that there wasn't the kids who always had, the kids who never had. Miss Brenda made sure every kid was clean. During the time of my mother's deep psychosis and illness, there were times she didn't wash my clothes. Miss, I would get cool in the house. My clothes would get washed. I'd come back outside and like looking fresh and so fresh and so clean. And my mother's honor and dignity stayed intact. Do we, do, this is the thing, but what happens now, we have supplanted village with program in our community. We have taught ourselves to not trust each other, not have conversations with each other. That it's better through the program. Programs close at 5 o'clock. Dinner's ready at 6. If we want to truly mitigate ACEs in our community, there's some things we need to do. One, we have got to broaden our perspective on who is an expert, who is knowledgeable, and who can be an ally. <laughs> Two, we have got to get real about engagement. That what I mean by that is people in my clinical friends talk about, well, I can't talk about that because of boundaries. I, now, I ain't got to tell you all, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going to change my inspection and go into African-American vernacular English. I ain't got to tell you all my business in order for you to understand that I can get with you. And then you can get with me and I'm real and I'm going to keep it a buck. I'm going back. We do not have to disclose things that are the most private to us to be able to forge a true and authentic relationship with people in our community. Three, we need to, in our recognizing and broadening our perspective on who has value and who's an expert, and in our making real relationships, we have got to show with our dollars that we believe in equity. I mean that in creating equitable programs in community. Communities need to be the owners of the tools of their own healing. And so in that, we need to invest in things with community, in community, let the community own their stuff. Create it, learn, teach them how to evaluate it, measure it, and so it is theirs. It also, on the practice level, looks like family support specialists. When I started out, like uh, Dr. Stewart said, I'm a nationally certified family peer advocate. When I started out, I, talk, I talked about getting my kids through the system. And I ended up bringing my lived experience, and people put it with theoretical knowledge on systems and how, and teaching about how to run groups and how to do all these other different kinds of things. And understand that this is a profession. This is a discipline. Just like teaching, just like being a nurse, just like being a mechanic or electrician or a carpenter, a family support specialist is a discipline. The only difference with this discipline is that there's a critical piece that you get that no one asks for. Do y'all understand where I'm coming from with this? Do I need to explain that? One of the critical pieces of being a, a family support specialist is that you are the, child, the primary child or caregiver of a child who's had mental, mental, emotional, behavioral challenges and had contact with systems. When each of my children were born, I didn't know, I didn't look at my baby and say, oh, you're just gonna go, you're gonna be so well when your mental health challenges manifest. I didn't say that. I said that my kids had 10 fingers and 10 toes. My baby, my third baby had, oh, you had so much hair, that's why I had heartburn. <laughs> Am I, am I, did anybody else hear that as, as, a, as an old woman, right? I didn't, I, it never occurred to me that I would be set on this odyssey of a journey as tram, um, having to go through systems. But it happened. And I gained a world of knowledge through that life lived experience. 
Then, but then I had to understand that there is knowledge there that you can't get in any book. And then get it coupled with some theoretical stuff, right? Some book, some book stuff that made me the woman I am today. But until we, until someone recognized, hey, and said to me, hey, Melanie, I think that you can help some other parents. And I'm like, what do you mean? And I mean, I can start out like this, right? And I said, what do you mean? And I had to build the confidence. And I said, well, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to, I, I can't run a group. Melanie, do you have people in your house? Say, yeah. Do you talk to them? And then, is there more than one? Say, yeah, that's a group. <laughs> and so I got group facilitation skills training. Then I said, well, I can't advocate to those judges. Do you know the law? Yeah, I know the law. Do you, do you, what did, I don't know what well enough, I know what it was could pertain to my children. Then I took classes in IDEA and 504 to work with schools. I understood juvenile law as it, as in New York State so that I could advocate to judges. But it all started with some professional broadening their understanding of who has value. And seeing that I could, just, I could be an equal partner. And as I did this and as I grew, I was putting a lot of time and they said, this needs to be, this is a position. We've had family support specialists in Rochester for 20 years. They are paid professional partners. We have family support specialists that operate in our courts. If you go to, if court is in session in Rochester today, there's a, there's a family support specialist sitting there and wait. We've used family support specialists in school. When Dr. Stewart mentioned chronic absenteeism, I was so glad that you gave me a door. What we do is when our, oh, I thought that was mine, I said already. Uh, when we have family, when we, we do home visits, in our school system for families who are chronically absent. Part of that team includes a family support specialist who does an intake with that family on the spot if the family wants it and begins to address the needs that keep that kid out of school. We have family support specialists that train social workers, train teachers, train counselors in understanding the cultural things of families. Because there's, there's more than one kind of culture. There is there's ethnic culture, there's religious culture, but there is family culture. And among us, us families who have kids with these kind of challenges, there's a culture, there's a language, there are social mores that a lot of you will never understand. But you need to be, but it can be taught. And that is the role that we let when we have trained family support specialists to do. We have family support specialists that do straight educational advocacy who make sure that IEPs and 504 plans are aligned and the goals are aligned with the law and that they're getting their services provided and that the parent understands. My second son has Asperger's. When I went to get his IEP, I did not, I did not know what words to say to make sure I knew. I didn't know how to make sure his goals were really gonna get him to where he's going to Southern University to study journalism. I did not know how to get there, but I had an advocate who said, these are the goals. These are survival goals. These are thriver goals. You need to advocate for thriver goals. Family support specialists work in community. They do trainings in churches at community groups about mental health and how to break stigma. Because they are credible messengers in their communities, because they're of the community, they are able to teach in the community and of the community how, what this looks like, and how to see that mental health is just like physical health, is just in your brain. And they make it so that it's okay to say you're not okay, it's okay to seek treatment. And they can help you walk up into treatment and stay and maintain a treatment. They can form, they form, we use family support specialists to form linkages and be cultural brokers, if you will, between our clinical world and our community. They translate language both ways. 
They educate and they support. These are members of the village. If we want to mitigate ACEs, and I'm sure, does anybody here want to mitigate ACEs? Yes. Does anybody here want to make it so your community, that you're, when you look in the eyes of any child in your community, that the fact that they have four, five, three, four, five ACEs does not dictate their future. Yeah. If you want this to be your reality, this is the work you have to get ready to put in. In full disclosure, I have eight ACEs. Eight. The only two ACEs I do not have is that my parents were not divorced or separated, and that, oh, what's the other one? Oh, and that my father did not beat my mother. Those are the only two ways I do not have. Risk factors are not predictive factors because of protective factors. Say it with me. Risk factors are not predictive factors because of protective factors. And I am not an anomaly. There are people all over this country, there's people in this room that you may not know because they had protective factors, because they had village. And we have to stop dictating what we believe village should look like. We, a woman who lived next door to us, two doors over, her name was Carol. Carol was a lady of the night. Now, if you, for those young children, young, younger uh, millennials, y'all think she was a sex worker. But when I was a kid, I thought she worked night shift. <laughs> Because, no, honestly, I thought she worked night shift. Because I, the, my, the grown-ups would say she was a lady of the night, which I meant, that meant she worked sea shift. And they said that she, when she did, all right, in Rochester, we have these, we have, we used to have these in Kodak. And there was a shift that you would work A shift this week, B shift this week, C shift, and you would rotate each week to a different shift. We called them tricks. So we said that, they said, when they said Miss Carol worked tricks, I thought she worked night shift and she would do trick shifts, right? And I'm, I'm being really honest with y'all, okay? Full disclosure. But the thing was that Miss Carol was a, vi a vibrant part of the village. And in the village, everybody has a job. So our job as the kids was saying that Miss Carol would have friends that would come to visit her. And we as the kids, if the friends were not being nice to Miss Carol, we had a list of people that we had to go get immediately. Miss Carol worked, the night, worked at night because she had a child with complex medical issues and she needed to be able to be home during the day. And this is the only way that she, as an adult now putting all the pieces together, she, this is the only way that she could make a living for her so she could be home with her child during the day. So if Miss Carol needed us to go to the store, we went to the store, we looked out for Miss Carol. But then also during the day, if our parents were at work and you needed something, you knew that you could knock on Miss Carol's door and Miss Carol would get it taken care of. Because if we didn't see Miss Roberta, Miss Carol could call Miss Roberta, she could call Miss Star, she could call Miss Brenda, and the network would come into play. But no one ever looked down on Miss Carol. The children were taught to respect her. And we honored her, and she took care of us. When my mother was having a, when my mother would have a really bad episode, you could hear it out the door. Miss Carol would knock on the door and tell my mother that I need to borrow Melanie to give me reprieve. We have a village. How many of y'all happen to think that there's a village in Memphis? Oh, come on! Raise your hand high. How many of you think that there's village in Memphis? How many of you think that if we sold into the village, and that we sold into the members of the village, and we provided them with the support that they needed, told them, because part of that support is telling them, like Dr. Stewart told me, that I am worthy, that I have value, and that I, and I am fully capable, and I am equal to anybody else. If we did this, that they would pull out the weeds, and our garden would grow, and our children would thrive. 
there's three things I want you to do. Now, I'm going to talk about this more in my breakout session, but there's three things that you can do to start to rebuild this village and so that our village has to mitigate ACEs. So as much into your village as you do into your programs. What that means is if you have a program and you're going out to present to a church, to a group about your program, present to them about a whole, whole series of things. Uh, when I go out to churches, I talk about very clearly, I may talk about the Mental Health Association where I work, but I also talk about what is mental health. I talk about mental health disparities. I talk about how does the church view mental health? And I, and because I'm a preacher's kid, I do it using the Bible and using scripture. I talk about the negative effects of what we do to children based upon, you know, different ways that they present. I talk to them about all of these things. And then when they have questions, I'm there and I'm present. To be present. Be present in community, not just when your agency is open. Be present. And then third, bring the village inside. Hire a family support specialist. I'm being very direct. Have them as part of your team. And don't, and don't say, oh, we're going to use that when they have the difficult family. In New York, in my community, we went through, we went through the thing where you had to, when you entered our waiver, you guys have waiver here? A Holloman Community-Based Services waiver? It's, a, it's the highest level of um, community-based service before um, RTCs and before you go to residential. We had an opt-out. Every family got a, got a family support specialist. You had to opt out. And you could only opt out of the service if you, after you met with the family support specialist. How many, did, how many parents do you think opted out? Less than 10%. What I want to say to you is that we have people in our community who can do these incredible things. And they're not so incredible. Making sure our kid is not hungry is transformative as a child who's been hungry. But it's not that incredible. Braiding a little girl's hair to make sure that her hair is not all frizzy and scraggly. Yes, scraggly is a technical term. <laughs> and making sure that her scalp is oily and gently brushed is transformative but it's not miraculous. Getting kids off the bus, knowing that there's someone to meet them when the bus drops them off, is transformative. Making relationships. Get helping our community, our neighbors make relationships with one another, and us making relationships with them is truly transformative but it's not miraculous. It's not rocket science. I have a village here in Memphis. I don't live here, but I got a village here. I know if I come here and I, and I hurt myself, I can call Miss Emma. I say, Miss Emma, I need, I need to go to urgent care. And Miss Emma will not only take me to urgent care, but she'll make sure that it, it make sure I'm warm, make sure I'm fed, and she won't just drop me off. She'll, she'll sit with me, and she can't sit with me. She'll call Dr. Stewart, or she'll call one of the Just Care family. Said, you remember Melanie? She got here. She got sick. She's at urgent. Can you come sit with her? And Miss Riley may come and sit with me. I'm grown, and I have this. What more can we have for our children? What more can we want for our children? I want you to understand and be clear. If you don't understand any more, anything else out of what I've said to you in this time, you have everything you need to mitigate ACEs, to reduce the number of children that are in juvenile detention, to increase your graduation rate, to reduce your numbers of suspensions and your, your numbers of chronically absent children. You have it all already. The key is how do you choose to see it, how do you choose to value it, and where are you going to spend? So I'm asking you to commit. 
You may say, I'm already committed. I'm a PCAT partner. I'm already committed. I work in the schools. Then I'm asking you to double down and commit to going to your houses of faith, to going into your neighborhoods, and talking and having a new kind of conversation, and seeing people with new eyes. We fund, the reason we see deficits is because we fund deficits. How, has anybody here ever been part of a grant? Have you ever seen the grants that we ask for? And do we ever talk about our community is filled with beautiful families? Do you ever see that in a grant? That our children love to come to school. We don't see that. We see we have chronic absenteeism. We see that we have disproportionate minority contact and disproportionate minority representation. We see that we have um, disconnected children, at-risk children. We have, and as you as you speak a thing, so shall you be. We have spoke deficit so long in the name of getting money that we become that's become our natural language. So what I'm asking you to do is to go back, way back you go, sorry, <laughs> sorry, had a moment, and do three things. Go to them and say thank you. Because even without you selling them, they've been doing this stuff for years and no one, and no one notices. Two, tell them that you see them. In the African tradition, there's a word called Saudi which means I see you. And it doesn't just mean I see you, like, brother, I see you. Yes, I see you sitting there. But my spirit sees your spirit. You, my liberation is bound up with yours, and I see you. My ancestors see your ancestors. And when you connect on that level, and you say you see them, then say, I want to join with you. I've told people that I do, the three areas I do primary work in, is fam building family uh, systems, family support systems, doing work with schools about making safe schools and engaging families in schools, and doing anti-racist work. In all of those works, I've said, I'm tired of having allies. I don't want no more allies. I need some co-conspirators. I need some folks who see that their liberation is bound up with mine. I need to see some people who I know beyond a shadow of a doubt. See my children as their children. That they recognize that every child is our own, and that they will love our children like Christ loved the church and gave up his life for it. Can you commit with me today that you'll find one person, one, I'm not asking a find one person, thank them, tell them that you see them, and tell them that you're ready to be a co-conspirator with them and draw them into doing this work of healing our village, mitigating these aces, and getting our children from surviving to thrive. Can you do that with me? Yes. If we do these three things, our children will grow, our communities will be better, and we will be able to stand here and be proud because the future will be in good hands. Thank you.